of the feast of our lady of assumption and the 76th anniversary of our freedom of our country very reverend father rector chakur budvarigil vice rector father shaji german father j michael maria reverend father dr shanu fernandes reverend fathers deacons and brothers first of all let me thank almighty for giving me this opportunity to be with you on this most auspicious day while passing through alve i always wanted to see the inner side of the campus of a seminary past six decades i did not get an opportunity to be inside this campus so i really thank god almighty to come over here to understand and to learn from you and especially the very experienced director vice rector and senior priest they are grooming all of you to lead not only the christian society the entire country while you are working in a parish or a diocese or in a in an organization you are serving to the entire humanity not only not only to the catholic or christian community alone maybe in a parish maybe in a school college or a hospital or a social service society you are always called upon to serve the needy people like what christ has done during his public life in fact let me congratulate both the brothers uh, brother paulson who has talked about uh, the contributions of latin catholic community in education and social welfare i think it is a wonderful uh, topic presented very well with absolute clarity and focus let me congratulate him uh, brother paulson on behalf of all of you brother anmod dominic said deep into the value based education and personality development in fact the most need of the most uh, dire need of the hour this era is refocusing and reorienting on values ethics and morality in our society when we look back the history of organized education in kerala the seminarian education as well as the general education the contributions of european missionaries especially catholic missionaries set the beginning in the 16th century and 17th century when they came to kerala and india they not only came here for trade and uh, business but they could in fact impact the education system social reforms and inclusive education for all the communities as it was mentioned in the first speech of the brother when only upper class were given opportunity to learn uh, or go for the studies education and writing and reading it was the first catholic missionaries especially the carmelites who came from <coughs> portugal and spain who laid the foundation for the systematic school and higher education in kerala in fact the subsequent protestant missionaries who came along with british people continued with a little bit of variations when i when i look upon the difference between the systems of education initiated by the catholic missionaries in the 16th 17th and early part of the 18th century and the subsequent english education the so called english education by british east india company there is a lot of difference the real christian principles values ethics and inclusive content was there in the initial 
mission, the initial education system and setup formed by the Catholic mission trees. Whereas in 1835, the first education commission by the then Viceroy, the Viceroy appointed uh, in 1834, Lord Macaulay. At that time, he was not Lord, he was only Macaulay, a scholar, who was asked to study about the need for education and higher education in India. He brought out a beautiful report asking for the Viceroy and the Crown to start English education in India. And they wanted, in his first report, it is mentioned that at least 10% of the youth in India shall be given opportunity for higher education. Even now, we have not reached that target. In 1835, Lord Macaulay wrote in his first report, at least 10% of the youth in India shall be given opportunity for higher education. Even now, we are struggling. So many education commissions came in India thereafter. In 1886, British government realized that there is need for reforming and renewing the Macaulay's Commission report. So they appointed Hunter. The Hunter Commission report came and they wanted to improve university education system, universalizing of school education, and more specific into the job requirement of the educated youth. Yes, their job requirement was only for creating clerks and supervisors for the British East India Company. Macaulay was very specific. They need to bring out those who can be educated to serve the British East India Company. By the time when the Hunter Commission came in 1886, the reign of British India was taken from the hands of East India Company to the Crown of India. So it was a royal commission. Again, uh, another 35, 36 years went on with his report. In 18, uh, 1919, the second Hunter Commission report came up. So they wanted to, after the First World War, they wanted to reform the education in India, as well as in Britain. And as a part of, along with Britain, they wanted to improve the education system in India. So things continued, then the national movement, freedom struggle, and by that time there were few universities, colleges, etc. We, we all know that our uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, Gandhiji, and various leaders who got opportunity to study from existing Indian universities as well as from British universities. Many good scientists, the education systems which were brought in by the Hunter Commission report created, say, Presidency College, all the, all the presidencies, Calcutta, Madras, and Mumbai presidencies, they established beautiful colleges, systems, very good scientists. At that time, we had even scientists who are capable at par with the Nobel laureates. Subsequently, after the independence, the first independent commission was model, uh, Mudaliyar Commission report in 14, 1948 was established. Basically, Nehru wanted to reform the education system in India, especially an independent Indian education system, with the views of much more inclusive and socialistic society, providing opportunity to each and everyone. But at that time also, the focus on the quantification, say, neither the Varadaraj Mudaliyar Commission nor subsequent Kothari Commission said anything about the percentage of people to be included in the education. Varadaraj Madhuliyar Commission also went on quite a long time. Then in 1964, the Kothari Commission was appointed. Professor Dr. Kothari was the chairman of UGC at that time. So they wanted to have much more deep insights. But Kothari Commission report talked more about 100% enrollment in school education and higher education, it was, uh, I may say, it was a little weak on uh, the, the growing demand and need for enhancing opportunities of higher education. 
Now, I think many of the senior faculty members here are quite aware of the three reports. The one is Kothari Commission report. Second is the new education policy in 1985, when Mr. Narasimha Rao became the Minister for Human Resource Development in the first Rajiv Gandhi ministry in 1984. He took up the task of he being one of the most scholarly political leader, statesman at that time. He was interested with the responsibility of redrafting the higher education. So at that time, in 1985, it is called the new education policy. Now coming back to year 2020, the present government, after three and a half years of study and analysis, published and promulgated the national education policy 2020. Of course, during the COVID and the next year, the implementation was not begun, but now from 1st April 2023 onwards, we are into the operationalization of the new education policy. Why I said all this thing? You are the youngsters, the young priests, brothers and deacons. When you go to the society, as the, both the speakers mentioned, Education is the most powerful tool for emancipation of the society, development of the society, and well-being of the society. Why I said about all these education commissions is, it is not only the independent India, even the British foreign rulers also started appointing commissions for looking into the educational opportunities for youth in Kerala, youth in India. Still, we are talking about improving literacy level. We had, before Service Chafian, Service Chafian is going on now. Prior to that, we have something called DPEP. All intended to bring in a 100% enrollment into schools. They wanted to have at least 10 years of compulsory education and ensuring the retention or ensuring at least 95% of those who have enrolled in standard one to complete standard 10. But these were all programs implemented, but parallelly it has gone. Literacy has improved, no doubt, but still now the exploitation, alienation, and avoidance of the weaker sections of the society and the poor sections of the society continues, irrespective of the education. Now, coming to the, the I, I talked about the comparison between the European Catholic education system, which was initiated in Kerala. Not only in Kerala, even South India, parts of South India, they have initiated education, very systematic, very inclusive, value-based education. And not only that, they were trying to bring in each and every community, irrespective of caste and creed. Tried to offer education free of cost. Prior to that, even the Gurugula, Gurugula system, as well as in the European system, only those people who have money can go for higher education. But here, everything was given free. Second is the scientific teaching, not only in science, not only in arts, literature, basic things like logic, philosophy, and I feel that the philosophy is the, is the root of all learning and education. In fact, subsequently, in the British education, they slowly try to avoid the value system as well as the philosophy part. And education without proper philosophy, proper foundation on the philosophy may not survive and sustain. So this is the one basic difference I could see. There are so many. Why I talked about all these commissions is that when I started my student days in the college, there were also a lot of discussions and debates going on in the academic community in the colleges at that time. While I was a student, I used to participate in debates and allocation competitions. So I have to study and go back to, at that time I started reading only from Kothari Commission report. By the time I joined a college as a lecturer in 85, Within few months, the new education policy in 90, 1985 came out. So the, naturally, 
the principal asked me to study the new education policy and elaborate and i was deputed as a teacher representative to represent the cor corporate educational agency and many other colleges to talk about new education policy so i realized that when we look into the new education policy of 1985 if i do not look back into the varadraja mudaliyar commission report kothari commission report khandra commission report mekale commission report i will be doing injustice the series of changes and the objective set in various commissions was different and diverged now again as it is mentioned the new education policy thoroughly change the patterns and outlook on education of course that is a, a topic not to be discussed today here i generally interact with uh, a lot of education higher educational institutions especially on higher education side because i got an opportunity to be involved in the discussions at a national level while drafting the national education policy and again when it came to the final shape it was my batchmate dr uh, anida was the uh, secretary higher education at that time so she used to invite those batchmates who came from the academic background academic background in the sense that who have teaching experience in the colleges and university or those who have worked as secretary in general education or higher education fortunately i started my career as a teacher continued there for 34 months at that time my principal gave me a lot of opportunity to study about the system not only in kerala but tamil nadu and entire southern state and i had an opportunity to be the secretary of higher education department in kerala in 2007 and during that process hold the additional charge of the vice chancellor of cochin university of science and technology as the vice chancellor of cosat as well as secretary higher education i had opportunity to be in the member in the committee of syndicate and senate of all the universities in kerala it was to my great shock that the higher forums or the highest forums of universities in kerala i have to admit and i have to lament that the quality of discussions and quality of uh, decisions taken in there in those committees were of very very poor standard i could recollect one or two incidents which i wanted to narrate with you all youngsters especially those who are seriously studying the philosophy and theology to become budding priest to lead the society in the kusat in the first meeting of syndicate i found that there were around 46 agenda items all the first 36 are on appointment of gardeners pions and promotions for making them permanent etc all simple very mere administrative decisions the academic points came from 47th onwards the 37 to 46 that also only giving permission to some teachers who are invited by the foreign universities to go for attending a conference and presenting a paper etc there is no talk about what the university various departments of the university were doing and what are their plans for the next year and the next 5 years i knew at that time there were very reputed world renowned teachers were there in gujarat but syndicate never bothered to ask them to present their studies research and their theories then i started telling the other syndicate members that we have to do three things one is hereafter every syndicate meeting shall start with department wise review and their plans so each and every department will come we will give them 30 minutes time for uh, sharing their views what they are doing how many researchers how many papers what are the consultancies taken by the teachers etc two or three departments in every meeting then we'll take a policy matters third will be we will delegate the mere 
routine administrative matters to the registrar, not even to the vice chancellor. Vice chancellor need not look into the appointment of pune and clerk, pune and attenders and gardeners. I think he has to talk and he has to interact and share his time with the faculty members and teachers and students. Then they told that, sir, it is not expected. Usually, a vice chancellor is expected to attend and chair the meeting ceremoniously and sign around 6,000 certificates because you know, the signature of the vice chancellor is very important on the degree certificates and PG certificate. Please don't ask more things. Blindly sign, blindly sign, dumb signing, and silently doing this. So this is the way in which our higher educational institutions were managed. Then of course I told that no, I cannot be part of that. And again, another thing I initiated at that time, even the few Nobel laureates were of Indian origin. Nobody who worked in a university or college in India has got a Nobel Prize till that time. So, how do we interact with the Nobel laureate? Can we give opportunity to our teachers, students and researchers to stay along with a, vice, a Nobel laureate in various fields? Maybe it is Nobel laureate for peace, economics, then uh, life science or physics or chemistry. And I checked up as a secretary of higher education, is there any teacher or any professor, faculty, who ever worked with a Nobel laureate? We were not having an opportunity. So I made a small proposal. Let us every year invite five or six Nobel laureates from various countries and continents to Kerala. Request them to stay with six universities at that time in Kerala, six universities, one week each. So one week means at least five days, so six into five, 30 days. So we wanted to bring them by providing their airfare, accommodation, transportation. And in each university, they will spend five days interacting with, not only from, uh, not only with the teachers alone, the graduate and postgraduate students, research scholars, and teachers. Of course, they, everybody appreciated that proposal, but the finance said that, no, we are undergoing financial crisis. That, of course, perpetually, there is a financial crisis in Kerala. From the date on which I entered the service, I feel that there is economy measures, financial cuts, etc. Even now, it is continuing. So, they declared. We just asked to bring in five Nobel laureates, five or six Nobel laureates, and keep them in Kerala for one month. See, if you don't, if your teachers don't get an opportunity to interact with a Nobel laureate, understand, learn, and talk with him, how can he motivate his students? But government declined. I did not stop my mind. I thought, can we address this problem in a different way? I asked the teachers' organizations, can you contribute 500 rupees? Teachers are all with the UGC scale of pay and all. So can you contribute 500 rupees? Can we ask all the PG students to contribute 100 rupees and graduate students to contribute 50 rupees? I think teachers' organization backed out. I think only 30% of the teachers were willing to contribute, of which, again, 50% only gave the money. But students, postgraduate students contributed. Graduate students also contributed to a great extent. Then we started communicating with the Nobel laureates. Understanding this story, many of the Nobel laureates said that you need not pay us airfare, we will come on our own. Then the next question was transportation plus accommodation. Then I called the teachers that, do you get, do you want to host a Nobel laureate in your house for a week or even one day? Can you think of the impact which can create into your children, your students and your own children, a Nobel laureate coming and staying with your home, in your home? You give him whatever normal food you eat, show him around. If you are staying in a town, show him around, take him around. If you are in a village, take him around, interact with the villagers. And happily, this worked out. Without any money, 
Only, of course, we could not get five or six. We could get only four at that time, first year. So they came, and the children were so enthusiastic that, you know, they wanted to, they set their targets a little high. I wanted to go and study. I wanted to do the research in a laboratory where a Nobel laureate works. That sort of improved anticipations, improved visions among the teachers and students. Now in Kerala, after my retirement, I thought that what I will do after retirement. Then I thought that I have worked almost 24 departments. During the 34 year of my career, I worked in 24 departments. But looking back, what fascinates me or what suits to my capability and my uh, talents, I realized that there are two, three areas where I should focus. Because of God's grace, I had good health. And uh, uh, rather than sitting idle after retirement, I thought, then I identified three areas which, I, which are close to my heart. The first one was higher education itself. Second was educated entrepreneurship. Third one was technology-based value addition in agricultural products. So which the first is uh, higher education. Starting from my first week of uh, retirement, I started identifying some good colleges. I looked, off, looked for uh, colleges with at least a half a century of experience, including St. Albert's and St. Teresa's, and even St. Paul's also. Uh, 40 arts and science colleges, 30 engineering colleges, and 30 management teaching institutions. Some of the management teaching institutions are within the college but separate department. Some are within the engineering college campus but with a separate management department. So started communicating and interacting with them for the last almost one year now. And I found that the inertia within the system is so great that it needs a lot of efforts to bring in even a small change in the education system in Kerala. When it comes to any new policy, any new initiative, I think I have not seen any other state in the country where the debate, discussions, and destructive mentality of people, media, and the so-called scholars pro and against any change. Whether it may be deemed, deemed to be universities in Kerala or private universities in Kerala, prior to that self-financing institutions in Kerala, introduction of computers or introduction of open software or paid software, everywhere it invokes lot of sound and fury, but decision will be we will decide for this, but by that time a decade will be lost. So we always lost like this. Now that is a story, now the first speaker mentioned about. So we have created colleges and universities. Now in Kerala University, almost 34% seats for degree courses are lying vacant. There are many colleges where certain subjects for degree, there are no applicants. I remember St. Joseph College Moolamattam because I worked in Idiki twice as sub-collector Devigulam and Idiki collector. That is one of the most flourishing college they used to get. I used to get as sub-collector and collector, I used to get a lot of recommendations for, for a management quota seat there. Whenever somebody asking for a letter from collector if they can fetch a seat, I liberally used to give. But now they said that, the principal said that, there is no applicant for a B.Sc. Mathematics course in St. Joseph's College, Moolamattam. There are few reasons. It is not only the exodus of youth from Kerala alone, our population is declining. The recent days, you might have read that, almost a half a lakh people, students are less in the first standard, this academic year compared to previous year. So our population is declining. Birth rate is slowing down. And at least in four or five districts, 
districts like Alapi, Patanantata, Kottayam, Ernagulam and Trishur and the lower ranges of Idiki, the birth rate is lower than the death rate. So negative population increase is happening. 10 years or 20 years to 10 years, we had division fall because of lack of school, children in the schools. So it is a way. Those children who entered during the period of division fall in schools, now when they graduate to college, there also division fall will come. So, reduced number of birth, less number of children, that is one reason. Second is the exodus of, exodus of youth from Kerala to developed countries for higher education and employment and settling down. We all know that Kerala population was always a migrating population. In pre-independent days, our people used to go and work in the then Burma, the present Myanmar, then Malaya, Malaya, Malaya means Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia region, then to Sri Lanka, then to Africa. At the time of Idi Amin's regime, a huge number of Indians and especially quite a large number of Malayalis were contributing and controlling the economy of Uganda. So then he smashed all of them, grabbed all their assets, nationalized all their plantations, etc. So Kerala society was always a migrating society because, you know, being a small area, we have only 38,000 square kilometers of land, of which 27, 29% is forest, then water bodies. So there is no space available for the population to grow and flourish. And again, economic opportunities within Kerala were limited. So naturally, people have to go out for seeking employment. Then came the Gulf boom, the oil boom, 1973 onwards. Then there was an exodus of our people towards Gulf countries, Middle East countries. Of course, at various levels. Like what we see, the exodus of people from Northeast, Bengal, and Bihar area to Kerala as guest workers. We were also guest workers in Middle East countries during the petrodollar time. Of course, we contributed more to their economy and a portion to Kerala's economy. When our human resource, which, dear friends, it is the most important resource, most important God-given resource. It is not only the minerals, metals, or climate, or plantation, or crops, or rivers, but the human resource is the most important resource. When we lose our human resource, in fact, in the individual level, it may be a boon to, for the individual and the family. But as a society, I feel that more than a boon, it is a bane. The best talents of our country, when we send them out, and if they study, earn, and retain there, it will be a great loss. Unlike all the previous migrations to the Gulf countries, Sri Lanka, Malaya and Burma, which people went for work seeking better employment opportunity, but they used to come back. Their roots were here. But now, what is happening is the migration in the name of higher education to various countries, various developed countries, the intention is not to come back. Okay, which are the countries where the people migrate in exodus or in large numbers in the name of education. Yeah, you know it. Started with UK, USA, then moved to Canada, Ireland, Germany, Australia, and to a certain extent, New Zealand also. New Zealand only takes small numbers. Germany started increase, uh, increased intake of Indian people. 25 years back, None of the German universities were in English medium. Now, in order to attract students from all over the global students, they shifted. Initially, they started bilingual teaching, German and English. Now, they realized that there is no German bride will work in Germany. So, they have to, the majority of their major universities started taking classes in English medium. So, our students are going. Now, which are those countries? Now, now let us analyze why people going there and which are those countries. There are around 190 
countries having membership in UN. We claim that we are the fifth largest economy in the world and the claim of our Honorable Prime Minister is that if you give me a third opportunity, I will make you the third largest economy in the world. But dear friends, it is a meaningless, it's an imaginary size of the economy. We are far away from the number one, number two and number three. We are not even in the fifth position when it comes to the per capita GDP of the 190 countries globally. Our per capita GDP, when you arrange the global world countries in the descending order, we stood at 122nd position as on January 2023. Our position is 122nd out of 190 countries. Bangladesh is ahead of us. Sri Lanka, of course, is ahead of us. Many of the so-called poor East European countries are all ahead of us. Libya is ahead of us. Sudan is ahead of us. Why you want to tell is all that friction and uh, uh, internal rivalry burned countries, even they have better per capita GDP than India. So this is the scenario. Money will flow to rich countries. Resources also will flow to rich countries. When I say money will flow to rich country, you may, you may uh, wonder. Money will attract money. Not only even 21st century, even 2000 years back, what Jesus said is, as recorded in the Gospel according to St. Matthews 25-29. So which all are familiar to you. Ullavanu veendum nalgapidum. Ireland, second Canada, third USA, fourth Australia, then New Zealand, Germany. Per capita GDP is the real indicator of the personal development and opportunities for the people. That is number one. We will not migrate to a country where the currency value is less than that of India. So, a country where currency is strong vis-a-vis -vis Indian rupee. So, that is the second. Three, at least theoretically, our youth will migrate for higher studies to those universities which are globally reputed and recognized. See, there is a global ranking of universities across the continents. If you get an admission, if you get an admission in the globally first 200 universities on merit, of course there is no reservation outside India, Kerala government give you a 50% scholarship for the people from backward classes and communities. If you get an admission in the next 200 universities, that is 201 to 400 ranking universities, you will get a scholarship with 25% of the tuition fee, subject to a maximum of 10 lakh rupees. So any of you get admission in the first 200 universities or the next 200 universities, you get a scholarship. Now I looked into the universities, especially studied Canada. Why I studied Canada? Because the batch, my batchmate was the ambassador there. High Commissioner of Canada was my batchmate. And again, the present, present High Commissioner of Australia is also my batchmate. Both of them told that, just look, they are not coming to the first 200 or first next 200 universities. They are all coming to substandard universities led by the unscrupulous agents and commission agents. And many of them in Canada, even latest message I got was in Canada, Majority of the intake were into community colleges. Community colleges, a certificate course will not entitle you to get a good job in Canada. But of course, it will give you opportunity to do a liberal course and work part-time, work part-time 
and you can earn quite high. A boy from a middle class or a lower middle class family, he will not even take his used plate from a table to kitchen, will go and wash dishes in a hotel. Even if his father may be a farmer, he will not even extend a small finger to help him, but he will go and do loading and unloading in Walmart, even at midnight, because, you know, midnight shift earns much better rates for part-time job. Normal day-to-day -day daily rates, daytime rate is 8 rupees per, $8 per hour, whereas midnight shift will earn $15 per hour. So they will work hard. Okay. Learning a better work culture. Yeah, I will come. Learning a better work culture is a good boom. That certificate and di diplomas, 90% of them are going for ordinary or below standard universities. So this is the plight of this. Third is the anticipation of getting a high value job if you complete a study from a foreign university. That is a fact. Even the very same employer, even in India, if you have a degree holder or a postgraduate degree holder from a foreign university, an IIT, and one of the best colleges in Kerala, the ratio is 1 is to 3 is to 6. I, I have a personal example. Two of my colleagues' sons got a job in a Bangalore software firm in, in data analytics. One boy who got high rank in the Kerala entrance examination, he got a seat in CET Trivandrum. Trivandrum CET is supposed to be one of the best engineering colleges. The second person who could not get that much of score, he went to VIT, a self-financing college in Chennai. The third could not get a seat neither in VIT nor in Kerala, so he went to a very ordinary self-financing college in Karnataka, Bangalore. All the three of them graduated. BIT man got PG admission in Chennai IIT. CET person got admission in CET for MTech. The Bangalore college person went to Netherlands for doing, one of the ordinary universities in the Netherlands for doing data analysis course. All the three of them were appointed by a multinational company working in Bangalore. The CET man, intellectually the top, he is given around 1.5 lakh rupees per, uh, per month salary. He has to travel in the city bus or metro. The IIT MTech person is given 2.5 to 3 lakh rupees salary plus a pooled car and a small house rent allowance. And the boy who graduated from Netherlands is given 6.5 lakh rupees salary plus independent car and a Porsche Bangalore. So friends, this is the attitude of even firms working in India. So in order to change this, so when you are going to the field and you are working in various sectors, these are some of the challenges in higher education. I don't want to talk about so many issues, higher education and education sector. So how can, so let me conclude, let me list out. How can we create world-class universities and colleges in India, especially in Kerala? Giving opportunity for access to study in such world-class universities in Kerala with affordable rate of fees. Second part is, can we create opportunities for part-time job to earn while you learn during the college days? I'm not asking the plus two and school days. Plus two also, of course, changed us. They already said five plus, four plus, four system. 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th are now into the school system. What prevents us from creating part-time job opportunities for our students and youth in Kerala? What stops our educated youth to get high-value jobs within India, within Kerala? Within India story, let us leave it. I start from the, bo I start from the bottom one. If you wanted to get more job opportunities, you wanted to create more job opportunities. 
There was a time in which East India Company creates clerks' jobs, supervisory jobs. That era is gone. Then the British government, when they took over the reign of India, they wanted more police force, local small magistrates they wanted to have from India, not the higher district level and above, not for uh, Indian people. Subsequently, at the time of, after First World War, they allowed even Indian people to write civil service examination, British civil service exam, then Indian civil service exam. So very few. So in order to create jobs, we have to have more entrepreneurship. Even though Bible says of entrepreneurship in Matthew 25, 29, even among Christians, even especially among Catholics, we forget this, this, we use this parable only for the preaching. Jesus has clearly, strongly said that when you are given talent, you have to multiply it five times, three times, as per your capability. World over, in sociology and management, this particular word, this sentence is termed as Matthew's theorem or Matthew effect. In management terms, it is the early advantage or cumulative effect. Those who have initial capital, he has the early advantage. A person or a company or a startup without capital has to struggle to reach that level. So somebody who is able to get, somebody who is able to get initial capital can grow fast. When you grow fast, you create job opportunities. See, dear friends, many people talk about Kudumbasri. The success of Kudumbasri was in creating. I think nobody understands that. Creating thousands and tens of thousands and lakhs of micro enterprises by the poor, uneducated BPL family women. So that was the backbone of Kudumbasri's growth. And where from I took the clue? It is gospel according to St. Matthews 25 29. Let us provide them capital bank loan, thrift loan, support from government, support from our projects, so they can grow. Can you believe that ladies from very poor BPL families who has never gone to college, they created certain products with some technological support, their annual turnover these days is more than 100 crore. If poor women or women from poor families who did not get an opportunity to go to a college, together if they can create a billion Indian rupee turnover by following the Matthews theorem, the Matthew effect, you can create a lot of entrepreneurship from the educated youth. So when you go to the, now I, I conclude, now when you go to the parishes, go to the institutions, whether education institution or higher educational institutions, please keep it in mind. If you wanted to keep, yeah, population growth rate is coming down, population is declining, Kerala is slowly moving towards Japanese style of society where senior citizens are more, or the Western European, Western European countries, North and Northwestern European countries also have the same, philo same phenomena. So we will end up as a geriatric care state. We may not have youth and people in the working age in future. So in order to retain our people, in order to grow our state, we have to create more opportunities for enterprises. And where from? More educated entrepreneurship from the campuses. That is why, that is why, uh, as I mentioned, I'm trying to personally impress upon the colleges, teachers, and now we have a lot of facilities. We have IEDC, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Development Councils in Kerala, colleges. Institution Innovation Council, IIAC, all these things are there, but majority of them conduct an inauguration by lighting a lamp or cutting a ribbon, conduct one seminar, then a conclusion evaluation, that's all. So now I ask them, can we create practice entrepreneurship in the campus? Dear friends, the college where I studied, uh, sorry, I taught, Mohatir and Ramila College, day after tomorrow onwards, they are starting a get together of all the campus entrepreneurs from across Kerala. A three days camp to share and nurture their entrepreneurship talents. 
so they will stay there interact with uh, bankers other fellow entrepreneurs to think of creating an entrepreneurial culture from the college then i feel that the college where i studied for 7 years pala st thomas college i requested them but they were a little more hesitant so name itself is st thomas so a little hesitant let me watch and wait one more week i will wait so let me i will i will do only if something else somebody else is not then i got a principal who is a my student he is a thomas in nirmala college so i i compel this thomas that individual thomas is easy institutional thomas is little difficult to compel so my my student dr kavi thomas is the principal of nirmala college he happily agreed maybe because of my pressure uh, they are doing it and again he was daring enough to take a challenge of at least 10000 rupees of income to all graduate students at least for 10% of the students of that college they have 3000 uh, children they pro they made a target of at least 300 students will be given opportunity to earn through enterprises at least at 10000 rupees per month so now i am eagerly watching for that now why you wanted to share this is you are all going to adore situations maybe after ordination in parishes or institutions even if in parish we serve the children we serve the youth we serve the women and you will have plenty of senior citizens also wherever whichever parish you are going so kindly keep it in mind from the small younger days onwards teach them bible strongly and help them to create the helping nature helping nature is not by giving donations or charity alone creating wealth and creating opportunity and creating job opportunities for the youth so that when you have more and more more and more employment opportunity naturally your wage rate will go up that is why people from assam manipur meghalaya bengal orissa come to kerala because there is better and higher wages in their country i know you know thousands of people from assam because as a chairman of coconut development board i widely travel through assam and many children they came with applications when i used to re, uh, go there in assam that seeking permission to get employment we need to give some permission then only they can come to kerala so they feel that by coming to kerala they can earn 25000 30000 rupees per month which they get there only 200 210 maximum 250 rupees per day there so this is the scenario when you create more entrepreneurship when you study in depth the matthew's effect and matthew theorem put it into practice you can ad- at least address the reversal of exodus and again exodus and uh, migration not always lead to prosperity situations in any place can change global situation may change you ca- you can recollect the the ukrainian mbbs students at the time of war the uk crisis right na- nowadays uk was a, a land of milk and honey for her education but now it is a land of sorrow and tears so situation in any country can change but i am very sure that this is the country this is a state where we have a strong foundation we have a strong catholic and christian background if we stand united work together we can create miracles in this land so once again wish you all the uh, greetings of our feast of virgin lady the heavenly assumption and blessings of our 77th day of independence once again thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to be with you and of course i wanted to spare some time with you for learning from you it was learning from the new generation and especially those who are going to lead and lead and show the light sadgamaya so that is where we the old people can learn more and uh, and update ourselves otherwise my learning is almost uh, 30 35 year old learning only thank you very much may god bless all of you thank you very much sir for your inspirational words for good in, for good ideas and true innovation 
you need human interaction, conflict, argument, debate. Now it is the time for the interaction. The floor is open for deliberation. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful message. And my question is this. Actually, dur during the last election held in Manipur, our Honorable Prime Minister promised that if his government was given, given a chance, that a peace will flourish in the country. So now we could see the peace that is flourishing in Manipur. At the same time, the fresh news was in 2047, our country will be developed. And now they are on the way. So while seeing back to the educational scenario, uh, many of the core teachings, uh, for example, the evolutionary theory, and everything has been taken away from the syllabuses. So if they follow this way, in 2047, will India will be a developed country, or will there be some values that are enshrined in our constitution? What is your opinion about this? <coughs> Very valid and relevant question. When I said development, I did not mean only physical and material development alone. The development of the human being, the development of the society, peace and non-violence. If we ask our father of nation mentioned, without peace and non-violence, even if we get independence, it is meaningless. I did not dwell much upon the aspect of independence and various facets of freedom because I thought that both the speakers started with uh, education and higher education. So I will also continue like that. It is a most unfortunate situation in this 21st century, what is happening in Manipur and even Haryana. These are not isolated incidents. In many parts of the country, many parts of the country, the communal tension and the communalism is maybe beneath the blanket, but when an opportunity is shown, it is easing out. You may not recollect during my college days, many of the graduates used to go to northeastern states for higher studies because there was a very famous northeastern hill university, Nehu. Many of my classmates went and studied in Nehu. It was quite a peaceful for higher education and it was mainly led by Catholic and Christian priests. There is a Don Bosco University in, uh, in uh, Gohati. There is uh, uh, various Christian universities in Shillong. Even in Arunachal, it is there. But these incidents, what when I, when I uh, look back, retrospect, retrospect, I think it is having deep-rooted reasons behind it. I can tell my personal experience in my batch of 114 IAS officers, there are only two Catholics. Apart from me, Mr. Lethking Hokip from Manipur. He is a cookie tribe. He was more religious than me on going to church and all. From Masuri Academy, we have to walk uphill around uh, uh, six kilometers to go for uh, Sunday Mass. So the Mass is at 8 o'clock. So he used to come at 6.50 to my door and he will knock. Joe's get up, we have to go. Then I told that, okay, let us go and have the breakfast. He told him, no, no breakfast. We have to go to church and then only we will have breakfast. Then he arranged through the priest a breakfast there. We have to walk around one, one, uh, one hour. Uphill, not the plains. Now off late what happened is, he retired as additional chief secretary like me last year. His house was set ablaze in Imphal. His three children, his wife and he has to escape and seek refuge in a Maitai tribe, his subordinate office for three or four days. So hearing that or knowing that the writers came to know that he is in a Maitai house, they came to set up, set up place that house also. Fortunately, we got the message and we intervened with our batchmates in the center. The defense secretary, our batchmate, sent a special aircraft, armed force aircraft to airlift him. So if a, high, if a uh, additional chief secretary rank retired, highest civil servant of Manipur could not save his life without external help. So this is a situation. I feel that even though the education was there, widespread education is there, our uh, 
evilish forces are in fact deep inside our human beings it is in the name of tribal conflict coupled with religious superstructures on that and majority okay people many people say that it is not a uh, communal clash or it is not a religious clash the uh, fact may be true but you know the the catholic institutions are the 99% or christian institutions are the 99% who are which are damaged and set ablaze okay reason anthropologically or sociologically they may say something but i feel that i feel and hope that with all our support and prayers one day peace will come and it shall come not only in manipur you know entire country maybe one more generation it may take and again i feel that our education as our second speaker said education for material benefit alone cannot lead to peace and tranquility we have to infill uh, instill much more strong values ethics and morality if you cannot save our brethren our fellow human being what difference is between us and animals i often i when i when i read bible especially uh, especially the the initial chapters genesis and all i feel that oh my god why did you give this much of wisdom to the human beings to kill each other if our wisdom our brain was little smaller or slightly above the monkeys we would not have i think no monkey is killing another monkey no lion is killing another monkey the only species who kill the same species is human beings god fortunately gave us more wisdom and more superior knowledge that knowledge is being used for himsa and violence so i think the only hope is yes i feel a the leadership b education c social inclusion and community development not the economic development alone community development means if you cannot protect your neighbor if you cannot protect your brother and irrespective of the religion caste or tribe then you are not a human being i feel had the leadership of manipur was more wise and fair okay initial form, one week it would have happened but not from the second week onwards had the next higher level at center been unbiased and impartial one and a half weeks time not more than not three and a half months so this is a scenario so we all feel that we have the responsibility to take up appropriate forums appropriate forums means even the parliament member from manipur was not able to speak in lok sabha the minister from kuki community and mlas from kuki community cannot go to imphal now so i am very sure i am hopeful and every day praying and seek prayer support from all others we have to prevail common sense and wisdom so i feel uh, some of you may be going and working in northeast sometimes and many of our priests are there many of our brothers are there many of our students were there so i think manipur is a community quite normally peace loving community unlike uh, nagas or tribura tribes or even meghalaya bodo uh, i have been to manipur so many times quite peaceful friendly people but some sort of instigation from external forces came in this time i don't know exact ground detail uh, ground details i don't know but let us pray i feel that prayer has the strength and the blissful <coughs> uh, situation to help our brother not only economic help let us pray to god almighty to prevail wisdom upon those people and their rulers on an independence day the most i pray is for our rulers and senior administrators let wisdom prevail or common sense prevail upon them